I'm delighted and a little bit overexcited to say that one of the stars of Will and Grace, Leslie Jordan, joins me on the phone now. Leslie, hello, welcome to the Joel Kayfet Show. Welcome, welcome to me. Listen, I wasn't one of the main stars, just to let people know. I wasn't one of the four. I was like an aging show pony that they trotted in with the singers. <laughs> I played Mr. Beverly Leslie. Oh, Beverly Leslie was an incredible character. And, of course, you won an Emmy for us as well, didn't you? I did, and I wish I could say that it was all me, me, me. But Will and Grace had the most amazing writers. There were 12 writers. And do you know there was never, ever, ever any uh, ad lib at all? Any word that we spoke had been written We would try to make up funny things, you know, because we were all talented actors. But I think they didn't want that precedence. You know, don't let the actors start writing or we'll never hear the end of it. So we would come up with great ideas. One time they let me, I accidentally, um, Jack was offering a shrimp to Rosario at Karen, Karen, uh, uh, Karen's wedding. Mm. And he said, shrimp. And I thought he was calling me a shrimp. I didn't know the camera was rolling. I said, queer. And they... (laughs) They kept that. Oh, they kept that one. But other than that, I have to. I have to defer to the writers for that one. Oh, you're so modest, aren't you? I mean, I. I, lo- I mean, I have watched every Will and Grace show ever, and <laughs> and I can still rewatch them. And I remember that one. I never knew. I didn't realise that wasn't scripted that bit. And of course, you fell over, didn't you? You fell over yeah. on the on the shrimp on the bit of prawn, yeah. which was a bit. But of course, it's all about the performances as well, which were astounding in Will and Grace. I mean, the writing was amazing. You know what? Also, was the secret behind that show. All four of those leads had a strong theater background, and so when you shoot in front of a live audience and they rewrite right there, I mean, they'll hand you pages, and you look at the writers. Are you nuts? But just do the best you can. But you have to be able to work on your feet and think on your feet, and that was the secret of the success of that show. Was the chemistry between those four and the fact that we could all had theater background you know which you don't find in los angeles you don't find that at all people act from the neck up you wouldn't believe the actors i've worked with that you would think were at the top of their craft and they're horrid that's that's fascinating is there something for me there's something really special about will and grace but a lot of my straight friends love it as well just because of the writing and and that chemistry that you're talking about and it's funny you know I, I got to meet Rosie O'Donnell recently in, in New York, and she saw my stand-up act, and she said, you belong in the casinos. That's big money, you know, those big casinos. And I said, oh, no, my stuff's too gay. She said, honey, funny is funny. That's like saying my stuff's too black or, you know, funny is funny. And I think that was the, the, the secret of the success of that show is it's funny, mm. Period. And I think I love the fact that America and also now over here, people welcome those characters into their homes. Probably some of them the first time a gay person had ever been in their home, even if it was on the telly. And they laughed and we were loved and progress was made. And I'm honored. I was honored to be because, you know, for a while I was the only openly gay one on that show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, of course. Until someone came out recently. But anyway. No, I know what you mean. It was a really special show, and I watch it on two levels. And, and you know, like when Jack came out on the show to his mum, you know, that made me cry. And then in the same Aww. scene, you laugh at the comedy. Right, right. Tell me how you first met Robert Downey Jr. Oh, everybody wants to know that story. I was at a jail sale for several indiscretions I'd really rather not discuss right now. And I had been given a three-month sentence for drinking. I haven't had a drink now for 13 years. That is amazing. Do you know what? I've not had a drink for five years. So. Well, congratulations. Yeah. It's a long time between cocktails. <laughs> but it's well worth it. It's the best 13 years of my life, and that's the honest God truth. But anyway, I was in this jail sale, and they knocked on the door, and they said, Mr. Jordan, we have good news, we have bad news. Good news is you're out. We got Robert Downey Jr. downstairs. We have nowhere to put him. Bad news is we can't let you out because of your record until the bars close. (laughs) So I said, it's 8 o'clock at night. The bars don't close until 2 a.m. in Los Angeles. I got to sit here. They said, well, you're going to sit with Mr. Robert Downey Jr. And I said, that's the bad news. (laughs) Oh, my God. So anyway, I shared a jail cell with him. Wow. And uh, we didn't speak. He was very sick. I don't know what he was coming off of, but here we both are off of everything and enjoying great amount of success. So there you go. That's I incredible. Guess. And and you met him a bit later on in your career, didn't you? 
we met on Allie McBeal, and I had asked my mother, because I don't watch television, I guess because I act in TV, I can't bear to watch it. And so I asked my mother, who plays uh, uh, Drake on the show? And she said, oh, that's that Robert Downey Jr. I said, oh, my God, I was in jail with him. And my sweet mother, she said, well, honey, I wouldn't tell everybody. I said, well, I'm not going to. But anyway, I met him in front of everybody. There was Callista Flockhart and all the stars of Allie McBeal. And, and he said, I know you. How do I know you? And I was going, zip it, like under my, under my breath. And zip it, zip it, zip it. Oh, that was so funny. No, but he God. came up to me later on and he said, um, how do I know you? And I said, 152, pod A, cell 13. You were the top. I was the bottom. Meaning <laughs> the bump. Oh. And he hollered. That but is we, hysterical. He said to me, he said, you wrote me that letter. And I had forgotten about this completely. But on my in my little jail group was a boy that was HIV positive, And the other prisoners treated him unmercifully. They would say, don't sit with him. He got the AIDS. Don't you go near him. He got the AIDS. Don't go by him. He got the AIDS. And so I sat right down with him. And the, the young man got tears in his eyes. And he said, you don't have to do this. And I said, oh, yes, I do. And I took him under my wing. But when I got out of jail, I thought, who's going to watch after him? I thought, maybe Robert Downey will. And I was privy to where he was. You know, no one else in America could write him a letter, but I could because I knew where he was. I said, one, Robert Downey Jr., 152, pod A, cell 13, top, top bunk, and I wrote him a letter, and I asked him to please watch after my young friend who was HIV positive. And when I bumped into Robert Downey Jr. all those years later, both of us clean and sober, um, he said to me i carried that letter with me my entire incarceration oh wow and so what an I'm amazing story i'm in love with him i know that you do a lot of work for the trevor project i mean right. did, did you encounter a lot of uh, or a bit of homophobia at school growing up what are you kidding i grew up in the deep south in the hills of tennessee in the 1960s listen we have this we have this game called dodgeball where you line up on either side of the gymnasium and they throw the you throw the ball as hard as you can and you hit somebody and they they would say smear the queer and hit me with that oh ball God. listen my whole life and and that the reason the reason that I wrote my book my trip down the pink carpet which it, the show is based upon was because the Trevor Project had this statistic they told me about when they plugged in many many years ago they were completely overwhelmed they got fifteen thousand calls mm. from young people who were gay and were considering suicide. All the majority of those calls came from the Bible Belt, which is where I'm from, the deep, deep South. And I thought, you know, for someone to learn to hate themselves in a church pew is just not right. And so I wrote uh, my book about that, which is a big theme in the in the show. People people will laugh. It's it's wildly funny, but it does have a little oomph to it, and that's what I'm really proud of. I suppose that's like Will and Grace as well. You know, it was funny, exactly. but really strong messages. And, and like the Joel Kayfett show as well. <laughs> Hopefully we're funny. Um, exactly. but, but we've got really strong messages here. And I know, you know, a lot of stuff that I carried around, I was bullied homophobically at school. And I, I've carried that around for a long time. And, and, and recently oh, I've, I've kind of let that go. Uh, but it's brilliant to, and it's really inspiring to see and hear celebrities like you talking about this stuff. I don't know about here, but the worst thing a kid in America can call another kid is you queer, you fag. You know, it's the worst thing. And they don't even know what it means, really. So we've got ads now that say, you know, uh, you're, you're so gay. They'll say, you're, that is so gay. And they'll say, please don't say that. that that's hurtful. You don't realize it's hurtful, but it's hurtful. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And I think it so is about educating people. I mean, what, what would your message be to any young people listening to the show now who, who may be you know, questioning their sexuality and, and, and maybe being bullied themselves? Well, the thing is, what kids have today that we didn't have was the Internet. And you've got to reach out. You know, you have to find your tribe. You have to go where the love is. And that's what's hard about kids that are in a family, you know, maybe because of religious beliefs or whatever, and they're way out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you can find your tribe. You can go online. You can go where the love is. You know, we'll take care of you. That's one thing we learned older gays back in the 80s uh, when, when the AIDS epidemic hit was we have to take care of our own. 
things. You know, people were dying like flies, dropping like flies, and we had to, nobody else was going to do it. And so we started, you know, organizations like AIDS Project Los Angeles. We started organizations like Project uh, Night Light, where you would sit with people who had the HIV virus at night when they were scared and read to them. We had projects, you know, we take care of our own. And if you're a young gay person, you find your tribe. And listen, here's my second platform. If you're a gay person who's in the city, you know, going to the bars and wah, 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 vote. See, my big shame is when I got sober, I was 42 years old and I had never voted. And I thought, you know what? You can't complain. And you know, Queens, we love to complain. Oh, we so did. if you're going to complain, <laughs> you have to have voted. And I don't know how it is here, but in America, we, we, we're, you know, we, we're losing just by margins, which means if we could get more of the young people out of the bars and off the crystal meth and off the ecstasy and quit twittering and vote, then maybe we could get somewhere. No, I know what you mean. That's interesting you say that. As I'm joined in the studio, my co-presenter is London Mayor Jonathan Simpson, who is a gay man, an out proud uh-huh. gay man. <laughs> it's funny calling you that, Jonathan. Um, but, but I know, you know, it is amazing to have lesbian and gay visibility, I suppose, in, in politics, really. Well, see, we learn also, I mean, I'm a product of the 60s. So we learned, you know, that it's okay to march in the streets and be radical, but that doesn't change things. All that does is draw attention to your cause. All the change has to come from within. That's just the way it is, period. You know, you can march in the streets till the cows come home, and you can act up till the cows come home. It's not going to garner the change like just one person telling another person, telling another person, let's get out, let's vote, let's change this. And um, so it's amazing that me... Having never voted, 42 years of age, never thought about it, had no shame about it, because I had never thought about it. Mm. Vote? Honey, you couldn't get me out of the club. (laughs) <laughs> no, I know, I know that feeling. God. <laughs> Amazing. Well, look, we're very lucky because you're in London at the moment and you're just about to start doing your show, My Trip Down the Pink Carpet. Yeah, I just walked by the Apollo Theatre. I'm in between Thriller and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Now, basically, so it's your one man show you were telling us about before. Lots and lots of showbiz stories, isn't it? Right. It's a lot of showbiz. It's a lot of uh, uh, people that I've worked with. The, the sort of theme of it is that I am a high school cheerleader stuck in a 55-year-old male body. And so I write in my diary nightly. I also get incredible crushes on my straight co-stars. And in my head, I create huge fantasies. You know, I've had affairs with George Clooney. You wouldn't believe what all happened. Wow. I've had affairs with... Billy Bob Thornton, and you know, you show up for work and you've broken up one day because he didn't speak to you, and then you're back with him the next, and all these fantasy affairs that I've had with all these people, completely in my head, completely made up. (laughs) you'll be privy to them oh wow that'll be amazing to hear about and i'm actually i'm going to come to your press night and i'm going to be talking to all the stars at your post-show party which i'm very oh. excited about. we're going to make a little film of it also my radio show is actually on a jewish uh, radio station and i might bring some of my homemade chopped liver for people to try we would love chopped liver oh you I think... and your chicken liver will be welcome oh I'll wonderful I'll even tell you of the time I went to the Seder feast with James Earl Jones and uh, the 80-year-old Jewish lady had never had a black man in her home and she br- served watermelon. <laughs> 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 and oh, I have pictures of James Earl Jones and I in yarmulkes eating our watermelon. <laughs> well, there we go. Well, I'm so excited about coming to see your show. Now, I know <laughs> it's called My Trip Down the Pink Carpet. It opens at the Apollo Theatre London from the 26th of January. That's this week. And it closes on the 19th of February. Now, apparently, if you go to apollotheatre.co.uk, um, ticket prices start at 26.50, which it sounds like it's a complete bargain, that. Well, she don't come cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, will you taste my chopped liver when I come to your post show party? Absolutely. Wonderful. I had chopped, believe it or not, I had chopped liver yesterday on a crostini. Oh, amazing. Well, that's good. It does make me a bit farty, though, I have to say, Leslie. <laughs> it does. But never mind. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be okay. Okay. Thank you for talking to me. Oh, Bye-bye. lovely to talk to you. Thanks, Leslie.